future. Thank you. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presenting officer, exam result data for every secondary school in Scotland has been published in recent days. And once again, we've learned of the stark gaps in attainment for rich and poor areas. Attend a school where the vast majority of pupils are from the most deprived backgrounds and only 15% achieve five or more hires. But go to a school where the vast majority of pupils are from the most affluent backgrounds and that achievement rate is over four times higher. Where advances have been made in reducing the attainment gap, we welcome it. But does the First Minister believe that progress to do so, her government's stated number one priority, is fast enough? First Minister. Uh, no, I want to see it accelerate. I haven't made any bones about that. We know we have an attainment gap in our schools. I think it's fair to say that Scotland is not unique in having an attainment gap between uh, our uh, most well-off and least well-off uh, pupils. Uh, however, we have identified it as something that is unacceptable and we are determined uh, to see close. We've seen across a range uh, of data in recent times, evidence, as Ruth Davidson has acknowledged, of that attainment gap uh, closing. We see that in our schools. We see that also, for example, in access to universities and higher education. I think that progress is welcome, but it's exactly because we want to not just continue, but accelerate that progress that we are investing over uh, the course of uh, this parliament, 750 million pounds through our attainment fund. And of course, Ruth Davidson will be aware of the recent uh, interim evaluation of the first two years of the Attainment Scotland Fund, uh, where 78% of head teachers indicate that there has been improvement or they expect to see improvement in attainment as a result of that uh, fund. So this is progress. I think it's positive progress, uh, but I've made very clear that we will not close the attainment gap overnight, but I am determined that we make the progress that we have committed to making over the course uh, of this parliament and of course beyond. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister mentions the report into the Scottish Government's attainment fund that was published last week, but she fails to mention one part, which is that millions of pounds from that fund, which is intended to drive up the performance of poor pupils, is still lying unspent because of difficulties in recruiting. In other words, money that should be spent on cutting the attainment gap now is instead lying in the government's bank account because they can't find the teachers to spend it on. Does she agree that if we're going to close the attainment gap in schools, um, that we won't manage that if we can't find the teachers to help do it? Yeah. First Minister. Well, I, I think Ruth Davidson's question, with the greatest of respect to her there, uh, displays a, a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of the funding in, uh, behind the attainment programme. It's a £750 million commitment across uh, this entire parliament. So any money not spent in one year rolls forward to the next year and every single penny, of course, will be spent in on measures to uh, reduce that attainment gap. In the early years of a programme, while plans are being put in place, and yes, while uh, recruitment of extra staff is taking place, uh, there will uh, obviously be less money spent than there will be in later years of that programme. But let me just give uh, some idea of the scale of the programme and the increase in funding that we're seeing. Uh, so, you know, in the first year uh, of uh, the programme, there was, uh, I think, less than £10 million uh, spent in our schools. Uh, in this financial year, there will be £179 million spent through the Attainment Fund. That's both the money that goes to schools, but also uh, most of that money, £120 million of that money, is through the Pupil Equity Fund, which has been received very, very positively by head teachers and by teachers generally, certainly in the schools I've visited, and I know uh, much more widely. So every penny of this money uh, will be dedicated to raising attainment and also, crucially, closing that gap that we have identified. And I think all of us across this chamber want to see close. Ruth Davison. Well, the First Minister will know that there are serious questions over other parts of her attainment challenge scheme. Yes, there are millions of pounds from her attainment fund, which hasn't yet been spent, but there is also serious questions about the way in which the pupil equity fund is being allocated as well. Now, that's 120 million that's designed to be targeted at the poorest pupils across Scotland. But claims from across the sector say that that money is instead going on plugging gaps left by budget cuts or to pay for other costs like campus police, staff bonuses, and installing an AstroTurf pitch. Now, that's all well and good, but it's hardly closing the attainment gap. So can the First Minister give me an assurance today that taxpayers' money 
intended to help poorer pupils will do just that and stop being siphoned off elsewhere? First Minister. Ruth Davidson is simply uh, wrong uh, about this. However, if she wants to bring me examples of where attainment fund money is not being spent uh, on measures that head teachers uh, consider will help raise attainment, then I will look at them. We've had uh, one example which I think has been uh, rehearsed in this chamber before, I think if memory serves me correctly, in North Lanarkshire, where there was a suggestion that the money wasn't being used uh, in an additional way uh, as it's intended. The government stepped in, I think, to the criticism uh, of those on the Labour benches and made sure that that money was additional to other budgets. So that is absolutely the approach we will continue to take. Um, of course, the key point about the pupil equity fund, and I, I would have thought it is a point uh, that Ruth Davidson uh, would welcome, is that it's not actually for me or for the Education Secretary or for local councils to determine how that money is spent. It is for individual head teachers in consultation uh, with their staff and uh, with parents to decide how that money is spent based on their assessment of what will best raise attainment and close the gap. And I've been to a number of schools in, in recent times uh, where I've seen firsthand the work that's been doing. Perhaps some things that at first glance many people would think is that appropriate in terms of raising attainment? But in the assessment of the head teacher, for example, I was at a school recently where one of the things they did was take some pupils and parents where attendance had been an issue on a weekend trip and attendance has improved because of that among some of the most deprived communities. So these are things that head teachers say help raise attainment in their schools. And my last point, uh, presiding officer to Ruth Davidson, would be this. She says there's widespread concerns across the sector about the pupil equity fund. Frankly, I think Ruth Davidson needs to get out a bit more and visit a few more schools because when I visit schools, what I hear about the Pupil Equity Fund it is the single most important thing that is happening right now in raising attainment in our schools. Ruth Davidson. Presenting officer, I started the questions today saying where or if there has been progress, we welcome it. But the fundamental point is that if we're going to properly cut the attainment gap, we need the teachers to do it. And over the last six years, there have been a thousand empty places in tra training colleges, places the funding council said were needed, but which were never filled. Now, the targets have been increased, but this year alone, there are more than 500 vacancies in secondary school trainee places. We all want to see schools improve. We all want the attainment gap closed but if the money's not being released if it's not going where it should and if the staff aren't being recruited how is that ever going to happen first minister well there are uh, more uh, young people not just young people more people generally in teacher training yes we know recruitment is an issue not just in scotland i think it was last week or the week before i heard the education uh, minister in the rest in england saying that recruitment was one of the most significant challenges that we're facing in England, but the, in terms of vacancies in our schools, that is at lower than 1% of the overall teachers. And of course, we've got a range of schemes and initiatives in place to boost uh, recruitment into uh, the teaching profession and into our schools. But let's get uh, back to the issue of attainment. And Ruth Davidson's asked me a, a number, a, a stream of questions about the attainment fund in particular that I have to say to her are simply uh, not well founded. I mean, if we look at the interim evaluation, and remember, this is the interim evaluation of the first two years of the attainment fund. So it's before the pupil equity fund actually kicks in. 78% of head teachers say that there has been improvement or they'd expect to see improvement as a result. 97% of head teachers expect to see improvements in closing the attainment gap over five years as a consequence of Attainment Scotland Fund initiatives. Uh, literally every uh, school I visit, of course I, I hear a range of issues raised, but the Pupil Equity Fund is considered by head teachers, by teachers and by parents that I speak to as the single most important transformational thing that's been done in our schools to help close the attainment gap. So I would hope Ruth Davidson, uh, instead of moaning about that, would actually get behind that because that's one of the things that's going to help us in this government close that attainment gap for the benefit of pupils right across the country now and for many years to come. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. Presiding officer, uh, last week I raised the serious issue of umbrella companies charging workers on Scottish government contracts for the privilege of being paid their wages. Can the First Minister tell us what steps her government has taken in the last seven days to investigate this contract and to crack down on it? 
First Minister. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I can. Uh, immediately after this issue was raised by Richard Leonard last week, uh, Transport Scotland ordered an urgent investigation uh, into this issue. Uh, the pay slip that was, just in the last couple of days, I think, sent to my office uh, from Richard Leonard was found to be from an employee who was employed in the AWPR by uh, one of the subcontractors through an agency. Now, this bit is quite important, and uh, not just for those listening in the chamber, but for those outside of this chamber. It is, of course, at the discretion of individual employees if they choose to work through an agency. But on the AW well, hold on, no, this, this bit is actually important because in the AWPR, there is no requirement to do so because the subcontractor offers to directly employ all employees working on the project. That means any worker who wishes to be paid directly by the subcontractor can be, which avoids uh, any of these practices that I would condemn by agencies being applied. Um, the contractor has confirmed that more than 90% of workers employed through an agency uh, are paid on a PEYE basis uh, and all direct employees, all direct employees and all employees have the option of being direct employees are paid on a pay-as-you-earn basis. So we took this very seriously. I deprecate uh, the conduct by agencies that was outlined last week, but it is not a requirement that anybody working on the AWPR is employed through an agency because the opportunity for direct employment is there and I hope Richard Leonard would warmly welcome that. Richard Leonard. Well, um, evident from that answer and borne out by my understanding is that no one from the Scottish Government and Transport Scotland has contacted the trade union which represents the workforce on the Aberdeen bypass over the last seven days. First Minister, you said that you were outraged by this, but your government has made no attempt to contact the trade union about it. And, and let me be clear, this exploitation is not confined to just one project. Workers on the Waverley Platform Extension Project, just half a mile from this parliament, have also been charged just to get their wages. And this is a payslip from a worker who was on an hourly wage based on the national minimum wage, who on top of that had to pay a fee to an umbrella company to get his wage. It's dated the 11th of January this year. First Minister, isn't it the case that you've got no idea how widespread this practice is on the public projects that you fund? Let me, First Minister. Let me come on uh, to the Waverley project in a second because I, I do want to comment uh, directly on that. Uh, but before I leave the AWPR, uh, I, I'm sorry if uh, there wasn't contact with the trade union. We'll contact the trade union. But we did what Richard Leonard asked us to do. We investigated this issue and I've come up with the explanation that says I deprecate anybody who's employed by an agency who has to pay to get their wages paid. But on the AWPR, it, there is no requirement for any worker to be employed through an agency because the opportunity of direct employment is there. And that's a contract, yes, funded uh, by the Scottish Government. And I would have hoped uh, that that would have been welcomed by Richard Leonard. But let me come on uh, directly to the Waverley uh, project. You see, this is a network rail contract, and I have to point out to Richard Leonard that the Scottish Government has no involvement in the award of network rail contracts. Network rail, despite the fact that we fund them, network rail is a wholly owned subsidiary of the UK Government and remains accountable to the UK Government. But in the spirit of consensus, let me say to Richard Leonard that if he wants to join with me right now and ask as we have many times in the past for responsibility for network rail to be devolved to this parliament and this government then we will make common cause on that issue richard leonard presiding officer let's be clear this, this is this is taxpayers money exploiting workers through unethical business practices half a mile from this parliament with Scottish government money. It's not good enough. And you, can, and you can do something about it. Because Carillion is gone, a new contractor is taking this work over in a matter of days. Meanwhile, the workers in this project have been left in limbo. 
they deserve some reassurance today. And this parliament and your government should never underwrite the immoral exploitation of working people. So will you commit today? Will you commit today to work with the union to protect the workforce? And will you ensure that no worker on Scottish government funded contracts will be charged to simply receive their wages? First Minister. I, I think I'm speaking in English. I, you know, I think most people listening to me would understand what I'm saying, but Richard Leonard doesn't appear to. I've set out, I've set out very clearly the issue on AWPR, and I couldn't have been clearer that I deprecate uh, the behaviour of agencies that Richard Leonard has outlined, but I'm making the point that direct employment, where these practices don't happen, is offered to all employees yeah. on the AWPR contract. On uh, the more general issues, we do expect uh, those who deliver public contracts to adopt ethical and fair business practices. And that is despite employment law being reserved. We use all... Richard Leonard doesn't like this, but it is a fact. We use all powers at our disposal to encourage ethical business practice and drive inclusive uh, growth. But let me get back to this issue of network rail. Uh, yes, we fund the contracts, but we do not have control over the award of Network Rail contracts. In case Richard Leonard didn't hear it the first time, Network Rail is a wholly owned subsidiary of the UK government. Now, we can yeah. fix this, but it involves Richard Leonard doing more than willing the ends of something. He has to will the means as well. Yeah. All right? He has to give. If he wants... If he wants this government to be able to do all these things, which I do too, then he has to equip us with the powers yeah. to do it. Yeah. So I'll give him another opportunity. Will he join me right now in calling for responsibility for Network Rail yeah. to be devolved to this parliament? Yes or no? We have a number of constituency... We have a number of constituency questions. The first from Sandra White. Much, presiding officer. The First Minister will be aware of the absolutely massive fire that has just occurred at Sucky Hall Street in Glasgow City Centre, which has engulfed Tiffany's, is now in the Pavilion Theatre as well. Uh, can I ask the First Minister if she will offer the emergency services, Glasgow City Council, local businesses, and the general public at Sucky Hall Street is completely uh, closed down um, any help that they require or any further help that they require at this uh, terrible time? First Minister. Uh, well, this is a deeply uh, concerning incident in the city of Glasgow. Uh, as I understand it, at 8.18 this morning, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service was alerted to reports of a well-developed fire that had taken hold in the roof space of a commercial premises. A number of fire engines were mobilised to Socky Hall Street, where firefighters are currently at the scene working to extinguish the fire. I understand that crews have already safely evacuated the occupants of several nearby properties, but firefighters uh, remain at this uh, extremely challenging scene, and I know our thoughts and our thanks uh, are with them uh, right now. The Scottish Government's uh, Resilience Unit will remain in contact uh, with the fire service as this incident develops, and I will be kept updated over the course of the day, but I'm sure the whole chamber will want to convey uh, our thoughts to everybody who is affected by what appears to be an extremely serious incident. And Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I seek a factual clarification. The Scottish Government tops up council funding so that, such that no council gets less than 85% of the Scottish average. A report this morning suggests that Aberdeen City Council's top up is 1.6 million short of that minimum. In the media, the Scottish Government says top up funding has been given, but doesn't say if that meets the 85% minimum. First Minister, it's a genuine question to clear up the confusion. Does the top up funding given to Aberdeen meet the expected floor or not? First Minister. Well, we introduced uh, the 85% floor, uh, which Liam Kerr uh, refers to. That was something that uh, I know had been called for for a long time. I will ask the Finance Secretary to write to uh, him later this afternoon with the specific amounts uh, in terms of the funding uh, for Aberdeen. Uh, but that uh, guarantee to councils is an important one and one that we uh, fully intend uh, to see uh, committed to, not just this year, but in the future as well. Tavish Scott. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister may be aware that last Thursday, Highlands Islands Airports Limited announced their intention to introduce car parking charges at Sunborough, Cutcall and Stornoway. Uh, she will be aware that Sunborough is 25 miles from Lerwick and there are no direct public transport links to most of Shetland. Um, Highlands Islands Airport did this without any consultation whatsoever. Will she look into it and reverse that decision? First Minister. I'll certainly uh, look into it. Can I say to Tavish Scott, uh, I absolutely understand the point he's making given the geography uh, of the, the airport in, in Shetland. I, I certainly, if it is the case that there was no consultation, then um, that, that is something I, I, I think uh, was remiss of Highlands uh, and Islands uh, airports. But uh, I will look into this uh, and uh, come back to Tavish Scott once I've had the opportunity to do so. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I want to raise with the First Minister the case of my constituent who was diagnosed with remitting and relapse in MS in 2016. I'm, I'm raising my constituent's case because they're desperate to know if NHS Scotland will provide new stem cell therapy treatment, which was this week described as effective, safe and game-changing. The results of the trial produced results, and I quote, stunningly in favour of transplant against the best available drugs. And with a higher than average incidence of MS in Scotland, can the First Minister confirm for my constituent what consideration has taken place within the Scottish Government to have the treatment available to Scottish sufferers of MS just as soon as it will be in England? First Minister. Well, can, I, can I thank uh, the member for raising what is a very important issue? We do know there is a higher incidence of MS in, in Scotland than not just other parts of the UK, but many other countries as well. We are absolutely determined uh, that those with MS get access to the best possible treatment. As the member will be aware, decisions around access to medicines uh, are taken by uh, the Scottish Medicines Consortium. There is a, an independent, rigorous process there. I have the Health Secretary uh, write to him specifically about this uh, particular treatment and what stage it's at uh, in the process. Uh, these decisions are taken independently of ministers, but as he will be aware, a range of reforms to the, that, that process have been made in recent times to improve access to treatments, not just for MS patients, but for patients with a range of different uh, conditions. Uh, so it's an important issue, one that we want to make sure that patients uh, are getting the best possible treatment for uh, and the Health Secretary will update him further uh, in the next few days. And Angus Macdonald. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the closure of the A801 in my constituency yesterday at the Avon Gorge uh, for a period of five weeks due to the appearance of significant cracks in the carriageway causing disruption to businesses and residents in Falkirk District and West Lothian. The A801 forms a key strategic link between the M8 and M9 corridors and provides a strategic freight route between Grangemouth docks and various distribution centres in West Lothian, but has also been an accident black spot for decades. The project to build a replacement crossing at the Avon Gorge has been shovel ready for over four years, but work isn't scheduled to start uh, until 2020-21. Can the First Minister advise what options the Scottish Government has to help Falkirk Council and West Lothian Council bring that specific project forward, given the current condition of the A801 at Avon Gorge? First Minister. Well, can I thank Angus Macdonald for raising uh, an issue that is uh, hugely important to his uh, constituency. The A801 uh, is vitally important to communities and businesses in Falkirk and indeed West Lothian. Um, and it also has strategic importance in linking the docks at Grangemouth with the industrial and distribution facilities along the M8 corridor. Uh, the government has already approved a tax incremental financing business case from Falkirk Council, which envisages a contribution towards the cost of this scheme with the remainder of funding uh, to come from West Lothian Council and the Scottish Government. I understand that Falkirk Council's business case notes that a review will be required to confirm that the upgrade is viable to commence. Uh, I will ask officials at Transport Scotland to initiate discussions with the two local authorities to establish a programme for that review uh, and the ultimate delivery of improvements. Uh, and I will make sure uh, that either myself or the Transport Minister writes to Angus Macdonald uh, with a full update in due course. Thank you. We turn to question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister knows that Glasgow, amongst other places in Scotland, have suffered illegal levels of air pollution for many, many years with a profound effect on people's health and that transport policy has been making that worse. We're now finally seeing steps toward a, a low emission zone in Glasgow, but we've got a responsibility to make sure that this first zone in the country doesn't set a precedent for weak action because dozens of other communities uh, around Scotland need to see 
a sense of urgency. But Glasgow City Council's proposals have been widely criticised as painfully slow in the timetable for buses to comply with the zone, no action on private cars and other polluting vehicles. Friends of the Earth Scotland, and I must put on record that uh, my register of interest shows I'm a member, uh, Friends of the Earth Scotland have described this as a no ambition zone. Now, Greens and other opposition councillors have worked together to try and improve things, but does the First Minister accept that as it stands, this half-hearted plan would still guarantee that Glasgow fails to achieve clean air by the government's own target date? To borrow the First Minister's phrase, if we will the end, surely we must will the means. First Minister. Well, I, I don't uh, entirely accept Patrick Harvey's characterisation of the low emission zone plan in Glasgow, though uh, I'm sure the Council will continue uh, to discuss with a range of interests uh, changes or improvements <coughs> that can be made. But, for example, the Glasgow uh, low emission zone proposal incorporates all vehicles uh, and therefore, actually, it represents uh, one of the most challenging, all-encompassing low emission zones in Europe. It's actually uh, more akin to the London ultra low emission zone. Uh, and it's in contrast to many other zones in Europe, which often target only specific vehicles and, uh, and set much lower emission level targets. Uh, in terms of the lead-in times, I understand the frustration when you have uh, lead-in times, but a very high number of European low emission zones have utilised a four-year lead-in time. Uh, that is based on pragmatism uh, to allow vehicles the time to adapt. But of course, we shouldn't wait until the deadline to act. All road users should start to prepare uh, now, notwithstanding the fact that lead-in times are essential to allow owners uh, to prepare for the new emission standards uh, prior to enforcement starting. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure there will continue to be discussion here, uh, but I think Glasgow is to be commended for getting uh, ahead of the game. And of course, we have uh, wider plans in place for uh, rolling out low emission zones in other areas. Uh, for example, one of the criticisms I've heard uh, of the Glasgow plan is that it will have no signs to mark entry points. Uh, the intention is actually uh, to the contrary in that, and uh, the intention is that there will be developed and utilised ANPR cameras uh, to help with enforcement. So uh, I would encourage everybody who has an interest in this, and uh, that should be everybody who lives in or, or, or visits the city of Glasgow, uh, to engage uh, with this over the next period. And of course, in Scotland, we have set more stringent air quality targets than the rest of the UK, which I, I know, well, at least I hope, is something that Patrick Harvey would welcome. Patrick Harvey. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that the First Minister doesn't accept any of the valid criticisms that we made, even using the Government Environment Agency, SEPA's own figures, their own analysis uh, of the impact of this. It is impossible, impossible for the low emission zone as currently proposed by the City Council to eliminate illegal air pollution levels in Glasgow on the timescale that's being set out. We also know that there seems some lack of clarity. The, the City Council doesn't even seem to know if it can access all of the £10.8 million that's been allocated by the government to the low emission zone. They don't seem aware that the financial transaction 10 million figure is available to them to invest either. The money's been allocated, but it's not being spent. And this is a time when the, the government is happy to issue press releases about the last 10 years of uh, climate challenge funding, but still failing to back a net zero target for the next Climate Change Act. So does the First Minister understand the genuine concern that it's her government's agency, Transport Scotland, that seems once again to be the biggest barrier to change, accepting the self-interested arguments of profit-driven bus companies, will she take on the cautious business-as-usual attitude at Transport Scotland and turn it into a catalyst for change, pushing the agenda forward, getting the resources spent and challenging councils to do more instead of holding them back? First Minister. Well, what I said in my initial answer was I, I didn't accept uh, Patrick Harvey's characterisation of the Glasgow proposals, and I certainly don't accept the characterisation that we've had in the second question. What I also said, though, uh, was that I expected discussion and debate to continue around the detail of this, and I would expect uh, a range of different issues uh, to put forward uh, ideas about how Glasgow can go further, faster, and I would hope that the, the City Council would engage uh, positively with that. You know, Patrick Harvey mentioned a number of things there. The Climate Challenge Fund, uh, a huge success. I was delighted 
last Friday to uh, award the 1,000 uh, award under the Climate Challenge Fund, uh, and it has helped a range of community projects uh, deal with uh, the impact of climate change. Uh, in terms of the uh, new bill, that will be published in due course, and we will set out our thinking in terms of renewed targets there. But I can say uh, with uh, real confidence that that uh, new bill uh, will further establish Scotland as one of, if not the leading country in the world in terms of tackling climate change. And in terms of air quality, which is something that I think is a hugely, hugely important issue, not just for the environmental reasons that we often talk about in relation to climate change, but for the health of people living in areas like Glasgow. Firstly, we should say that we meet both domestic and European air quality targets across uh, much of Scotland, but there are still hot spots of poorer uh, air quality. That's why I welcome the Glasgow proposals. I would say, again, they incorporate all vehicles, and that actually puts them ahead of many uh, European competitors. Uh, but this discussion will continue, and I welcome that. Uh, and let's make sure that not just Glasgow, but the other areas that need to take action here are doing uh, the right things uh, to improve air quality for all. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Next month, the First Minister is off to China for her first visit since the so-called Scottish shambles. That was when the First Minister was so easily duped into signing up with two Chinese companies offering £10 billion when all they owned was a pub in Buckinghamshire and a suspect human rights record. When the Economy Minister apologised last year, he promised a new human rights assessment process. Where is it and how many times has it been used? First Minister. Well, actually, I was uh, reading an update on that just a couple of days ago, so uh, the Economy Secretary will come forward to Parliament with uh, an update that, uh, on that in due course. But uh, on my uh, visit to China, I'll be delighted to visit China uh, and uh, the Easter recess, uh, a, a trip that's been uh, endorsed and welcomed by the Scottish Chamber of, Chambers of Commerce and uh, the Scottish uh, Whiskey Association and no doubt by others. I'll be in China, uh, promoting Scotland and the Scottish economy. I, I tell you one of the things I won't be doing when I'm in China, I won't be mentioning Willie Rennie, because if it was up to Willie Rennie, or if people listened to Willie Rennie, nobody would want to invest in Scotland, because all he does is talk Scotland and the Scottish economy down. Yeah. Willie Rennie. The Scottish Enterprise will have set up a number of signings with companies for the first minister visit to China. Can she confirm that all of those companies have had a human rights check? Human Rights Watch are highlighting current human rights abuses in China. So when she visits China, will the First Minister raise the case of Tibetan language rights advocate Tashi Wanchuk? Just last month, six United Nations human rights experts called for his release from prison. Will she speak up for lawyer? Jiang Tang Yong, jailed for defending government critics just in November, or human rights lawyer Wang Quangshang, detained by police in August 2015, but not heard from since. Will she do the right thing? Will she speak up for these people when she visits China? First Minister. Uh, I'll speak up for human rights uh, in China, as I uh, did on my last visit to China. I will do the same on this visit to China. I uh, bow to nobody uh, in uh, my determination to play my uh, part internationally in promoting human rights uh, across the world. And I would hope that that was something that you would unite everybody across uh, this chamber. But I'll also speak up for Scottish companies and I'll speak up for Scottish jobs and I'll speak up for Scottish tourism. I'll speak up for Scottish food and drink when I'm in China as I will do in any other part of the world because my job is to promote Scotland, to promote the Scottish economy, to promote Scottish jobs and that's probably one of the differences between me and Willie Rennie. Some further supplementaries. The first from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, 367 children and 541 adults in Scotland were registered as active cystic fibrosis patients in 2016. Two living in my constituency have been in touch regarding the availability of Orcambe, a combination drug available as a single pill for treating cystic fibrosis. Vertex Pharmaceuticals is engaged in fresh discussions with the NHS National Services Division regarding the pricing of Orcambe. Although ultimately the decision for approval lies with the Independent Scottish Medicines Consortium, the Scottish Government expressed hope that Vertex will make Orcambe more affordable so it can be used in Scotland. 
Can the First Minister please update the Chamber on progress regarding these discussions? First Minister. Well, Ken Kenny Gibson is right, of course, to point out, as, as I did in response to an earlier question, that uh, these approval decisions are taken by the Scottish Medicines Consortium and that acts independently of ministers and parliament. However, last year, uh, the Health Secretary strongly encouraged Vertex Pharmaceuticals to enter into discussions with NHS National Procurement. Uh, these discussions are ongoing, and while they are commercially confidential at this stage, I would strongly echo the Health Secretary's calls for Vertex to offer a fair price and resubmit an application for or can be to the SMC as soon as is possible uh, in order that those who would benefit uh, from this medicine get access to it. Neil Findlay. Scotland has the highest level of drug deaths in Europe. Um, if this was from knife crime or flu, there would rightly be a national outrage. Uh, doing the same in policy terms and expecting a different result just won't work. So will the uh, First Minister take a bold step and consider uh, looking very seriously at working across Parliament uh, on a major change of drugs policy to stop people dying and end this public health crisis? First Minister. Uh, well, I, I think it is a national outrage that so many uh, people die uh, of, of drugs. We've had debates in this chamber before about uh, one of the, the issues being the, the ageing of, of the cohort that uh, used drugs when they were younger. Drug use, and I think this is something we should all uh, remember and welcome, drug use uh, amongst the younger population is actually falling, um, and that is, is a good thing. Uh, but there is still a major challenge uh, around drugs. That's why I do think we should be bold and innovative. The recent proposal uh, from uh, health uh, professionals in Glasgow, for example, which we do not have the power to do uh, in this chamber, is one that I am very, very sympathetic to, and that would be uh, one area where I would hope there would be some cross-party consensus uh, asking the UK government to give us the, the power to give authority uh, to proposals like that one, although I accept that proposal uh, would require widespread consultation uh, within Glasgow. So uh, perhaps unusually, I uh, do agree with Neil Finlay that on this issue, there is always a need for new and bold thinking, and we should try to come together uh, and do that and be prepared uh, to sometimes uh, do things that may be be controversial and may in some areas be unpopular but where there is an evidence base for them uh, we should have the courage to do them and I certainly want this government to be fully part of that and indeed to lead uh, on these issues. Stuart Stevenson. Is the First Minister aware of the very real anger, very real anger that there is in fishermen, fishing communities and right across Scotland after being promised last week by Ruth Davidson, after being promised last week by Ruth Davidson that the common fisheries policy would not apply once we left the EU, we find that we've surrendered at UK level and in 2020 the CFP will apply without the UK, without our fishermen, without our authorities having any say in the rules that were applied to fishing. Does she share my anger? First Minister. Yes, I do. I was thinking, I was thinking earlier on in First Minister's questions that uh, Ruth Davidson's choice of question today, important though it was, was possibly partly designed to keep her as far away from fishing as she could possibly uh, get. This is a really serious issue. And what we have seen this week uh, are a broken promise and complete betrayal by the Scottish Tories of the Scottish fishing industry. It is disgraceful. You know, it's only, it's only a week or so ago that Ruth Davidson was issuing press releases co-authored with Michael Gove, of all people, saying that the fishing community would be free of the common fisheries policy by March next year. Now we find out that they'll still be governed by the common fisheries policy, but to add insult to injury, there will be no votes around the table for the Scottish fishing community. It is utterly disgraceful. And I think the only, the only question for Ruth Davidson and the Tories is that when she issued that press release a couple of weeks ago, did she know the promise was going to be broken or is she just completely out of the loop with her UK colleagues? Question number five, Stuart McMillan. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what discussions she has had with the Prime Minister regarding Scottish Limited Partnerships and concerns regarding the reported involvement in facilitating organised crime. First Minister. The misuse of Scottish Limited Partnerships is a serious concern. Uh, the Finance Secretary has previously written on a number of occasions urging action by the UK Government on this matter. Uh, Scotland has a strong international reputation for financial services and it is important to prevent SLPs being misused for criminal purposes. Uh, while I welcome the Prime Minister's correspondence to my Westminster colleagues yesterday indicating that she will now engage on these issues, it's over a year since the UK Government's call for evidence on this matter closed. And despite that, uh, the UK Government has yet to outline specific proposals on how it plans to tighten the regulatory framework around SLPs. To reinforce how seriously we take this issue, I have today written to the Prime Minister pressing her to take immediate steps to reform the law in this area. Stuart McWillan. I thank the First Minister for that reply and I'm sure the whole Chamber uh, would actually welcome the new regulations which came into force on 26 of June 2017, uh, bringing around 30,000 Scottish Limited Partnerships into line with the new EU-wide anti-money laundering rules. However, reports still appear in the media. Uh, all these SLPs had allegedly been used for organised crime. But today's report uh, in the Herald is very much welcome. But will the First Minister uh, commit uh, to actually continually raising this matter with the Prime Minister? Uh, because uh, to actually help protect Scotland's excellent business reputation, which is more important than ever, with Brexit looming. First Minister. I absolutely uh, agree with this um, and firstly I, I very much welcome uh, the introduction of the people with significant control regulations which came into force in June uh, last year. These are aimed at identifying individuals and companies behind SLPs. That's an important first step in preventing their misuse. However, as many have highlighted, there continues to be revelations of criminality being facilitated through SLPs. More does need to be done by the UK government. This is a reserved area, so we will continue to press them to take concrete action to prevent their misuse. Uh, I think it's also appropriate to take the opportunity to acknowledge the persistence of colleagues at Westminster on this issue. Indeed, David Leeska the Herald uh, newspaper and uh, the efforts of them and others to keep this issue in the public eye. But I can uh, assure uh, the member that uh, just as with my letter to the Prime Minister today, the Scottish Government will continue to put pressure on the UK Government to take action uh, to make sure that people cannot act criminally uh, using uh, these Scottish Limited Partnerships as a shield for their criminal behaviour. Question number six, Liz Smith. First Minister, for what reasons 15 million of the Attainment Scotland Fund out of 52 million provided to local authorities and schools had reportedly not been spent? First Minister. Uh, well, I'm tempted to say for the same reasons I gave to Ruth Davidson just a, a few minutes ago, but um, our commitment is to invest £750 million over this Parliament, and let me repeat, that's exactly what we will do. Uh, in 2015-16, spending through the Attainment Scotland Fund stood at less than £6 million. I think I said £10 million to Ruth Davidson earlier on, less than £6 million. In the coming year, uh, £179 million uh, of spending is planned. That's a 30-fold increase. Uh, this includes £59 million in the nine councils which form the challenge authorities and the challenge schools across Scotland and 120 million in pupil equity funding which of course is spent at the discretion of head teachers in almost every school in the country. Um, as this programme has accelerated some elements of the programme uh, rolled over their budgets into the following year uh, largely where time was needed to recruit staff but of course the value of making a pledge for the whole of the parliament uh, is the fact that the money uh, did roll over and not a single penny of the 750 million pounds was uh, or will be lost. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, First Minister. As well as the problems that were highlighted by Ruth Davidson earlier, many local authorities are also highlighting the fact that the timescales for the financial year which govern national and local government budgets do not actually coincide with the timescales for the school year. And they're reporting that that's detrimental to the effective spending of the attainment fund since the bulk of the activity has had to be put into the period between October and April. Does the First Minister agree that that is a very genuine concern among schools and will she agree to address that with considerable urgency? First Minister. Uh, of, of course we will talk uh, to local authorities and schools about how we ease that. I, I think uh, as the, the programme uh, goes into later years that becomes actually less of an issue because there is more certainty um, about funding uh, over the, the or between uh, different years. Uh, I, I should say to uh, the member and I'm 
I'm sure she will appreciate this, that to some extent our, the timescale of our budgets uh, are dependent on the timescale of Westminster budgets because so much of our funding is still determined uh, by the block grant. So we are to some extent restricted and uh, the Finance Committee of course has uh, been looking at this issue uh, in detail recently but within that uh, we will do everything we can to make sure there is as much certainty about funding uh, available to schools in a way that allows them to use that money to maximum effect. So it's a reasonable issue uh, I think for Liz Smith to raise and we will certainly continue to seek to address it. Thank you very much and that concludes First Minister's questions. Apologies to all those who didn't get a chance to ask the question. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Joanne Lamont on Down Syndrome Awareness Week and we'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.